the Geological Society of London into this, our sixth public lecture of 2017, which is entitled Sinkholes, Collapsing Houses, Alice in Wonderland and Witches, a very intriguing title. My name is Richard Hughes and I'm the Executive Secretary here at the Geological Society and it's my great pleasure to introduce you uh, today to our speaker, uh, Dr Tony Cooper. Uh, just a little, a few words about the, the background to this talk. Um, soluble, locks, soluble rocks like limestone, gypsum and salt all dissolve underground, resulting in cavities and cave systems that may collapse, causing sinkholes to form at the surface. Limestone, as I'm sure everyone knows, dissolves very slowly and is well known for hosting extensive caverns, cave systems that I'm sure many of us have uh, visited over the years. But gypsum and salt, on the other hand, dissolve much faster. They also produce cave systems, but they evolve on a human time scale rather than the geological one, and are seldom seen. As a consequence of their very rapid rate of, of dissolution, they um, collapse, and they often collapse catastrophically, as will become evident from Tony's talk uh, this afternoon. So these kinds of cave systems pose a geological hazard that can cause sinkholes to develop and rapidly spread. Natural gypsum dissolution has resulted in severe sinkhole problem uh, affecting Ripon in North Yorkshire and further north at Croft, which is just outside Darlington in County Durham. And this is where it gets interesting because both these places were frequented by the youthful Charles Ludwig Dodgson, better known as Lewis Carroll. And sinkholes may well have inspired uh, themes in his Alice in Wonderland um, uh, books. Tony, Tony Cooper, who is now an honorary research associate at the British Geological Survey, is a former survey geologist whose area of expertise um, included Ripon. In fact, I know also that Tony retired, I think, as the geologist with responsibility for Yorkshire and the Humber, regional geologist. He's made a lifelong study of sinkholes, both as geological phenomena in their own right, um, but also as hazards. And his public presentation of the Alice Connection at the British Association Science Meeting in the early 1990s gained worldwide media coverage and is today still remembered fondly by some science journalists as perhaps the perfect BA science story. Uh, before I hand over to Tony, just a few, a couple of personal reflections for five seconds. It just so happens that Tony and I worked very closely um, at earlier stages of our career. So I happen to know that Tony's not just an expert in dissolution and cast and the sinkholes and the, the um, subject matter for this afternoon, but he is also a great expert in the Quaternary of Northern England and in the lower Paleozoic rocks of the Lake District, where we work very closely. So I know a lot of stories about Tony, most of which he'd be grateful if I didn't mention to you any further this afternoon. But nevertheless, um, at this point, ladies and gentlemen, I'd have enormous pleasure in handing over to Tony Cooper. Thank you, Thank you Richard. Uh, yeah, we had a great time in the Lake District together and uh, spent a lot of time surveying the Skiddaw Slates in the north of the Lake District and published quite a few papers on them. Uh, but while I was doing that, I was also playing around with soluble rocks and um, having aircraft fly over Yorkshire and all sorts of things. So this, this has not so much been a hobby, but it's been something that I've managed to carry on throughout my survey career uh, and eventually ended up as both regional geologists for Yorkshire, but also as team leader for shallow geohazards and risks at the Geological Survey. And this talk goes over some of the hazards and risks that I've been involved in over the years. Well, Richard alluded to Alice in Wonderland. He's almost taken the steam out of, of my presentation there, but um, Alice in Wonderland was originally written by Lewis Carroll as a book called Alice Underground. And if you search on the internet, you can actually download a facsimile copy of uh, the original book. And there's a page from it on, on the left there. Uh, Lewis Carroll was also properly known as Charles Dodgson. Charles Dodgson, sorry. Um, and he wrote this book for Alice Liddell. Now, 
we all know about Alice falling down underground, but down, down Alice fell, following the white rabbit. Curious and curious, she thought, in this underground wonderland, the walls are made of sparkly gypsum. caso 42 h 2 So my apologies to Lewis Carroll for that, but that's the crux of the talk. Um, I talk about gypsum, I talk about salt, and I talk about the hazards and things that are related to them. But there is actually a very strong connection between Lewis Carroll and sinkholes and holes in the ground. And it doesn't take much imagination to, to see how they could have inspired him to write the Alice in Wonderland story. She went down a rabbit hole, allegedly in the book, but where um, Lewis Carroll's um, father lived at the time that he wrote Alice in Wonderland, it was the town of Ripon. And in the town of Ripon, um, Lewis Carroll was was ordained as a clergyman. His father was a canon in, in Ripon. Uh, there was also another canon in Ripon, Canon Badcock, and some documentation suggests that his daughter was the illustration for Alice in Wonderland. A picture of her was used as something like this little girl for John Tenniel to, to, to draw. She lived at your lodge in Ripon, and in the front garden of that lodge, which had a nice drive swinging in and then swinging back out again, there was a sinkhole. Now, I've got a pointer here. Your lodge, which I just showed you, is that building there on the right. And this, this sinkhole occurred in uh, 1997. And it initially took, took away two garages. Uh, and the um, building surveyor said, oh, it's bad building that's caused this. And then the la poor lady started to see cracks appear through the middle of her house and noises in the night. And I went up there and looked at it and said, well, they're all concentric to this sinkhole, which this hole I happened to map in, in about 1980 before they built these houses. And I did tell the builder that there was a sinkhole there <laughs> and that where he planned to put the garages, it was across a sinkhole. Uh, but they took absolutely no notice whatsoever. I drew one bore hole for the retaining wall and consequently, two garages fell down. I went to look at it, and then a few weeks later, uh, this appeared and took the, the other garage out, cracked the house, and caused a bit of chaos. And the poor lady had to move out. And the house is actually still standing, but they fill this hole in regularly and, uh, uh, with fine material, and it just keeps funneling in. Anyway, Charles Dodgson, his, his father was a canon at uh, Ripon, but in his early years, he lived at uh, Croft near Darlington. <laughs> now, Croft near Darlington is also an interesting place from the point of view that a mile up the road or so from where uh, Lewis Carroll lived at uh, Croft Rectory, there's this. This is Hell's Kettle. It's a sinkhole that formed in about the 12th century. And there are all sorts of myths about it. And it's said that um, there's a, a farmer who, who worked on a Sunday doing eternal penance by plowing around the bottom of this. Um, it steams in the winter. It smells of sulphur. It doesn't freeze. It's a very strange place. And the reason for that is that it's got sulphate-rich groundwater coming up under artesian pressure, which then overflows out of that pond. And this was just up the road, this, this hole in the ground with a story attached to it. And... As I say, in later years, um, his father moved to Ripon. Now, it just happened at Ripon. Um, the clergy in those days were the intelligent people. They were the people that actually had spare time. A lot of paleontologists were clergymen and, and early geologists. And around Ripon, it was no different. The Reverend Toot, who lived at Markington down the road, um, published the, a paper uh, in uh, 1868, 1870, and this is a, a map from his paper showing holes that have appeared in the ground. And he, he actually surmised what, what was going on very well um, and drew this showing the rocks disappearing and breccia pipes and things going up. There was also a collapse in uh, 1860, just where the golf course is now. And the Reverend Dunwell was taking a party of school children there. And this collapse happened, and they saw the earth go up and then a big hole in the ground. So it was the air coming out, forcing the earth up, um, that uh, happened when the, when the collapse occurred. And 
you know, there, there's these connections between sinkholes, the clergy in Ripon, Lewis Carroll's father in Ripon, some friends of his in Ripon that uh, also had sinkholes. And in 1834, this had occurred just behind um, the house where Canon Badcock lived. So the other side of the railway station. Uh, this is in Sherwood Sandstone, the Triassic Sherwood Sandstone. It's about 11 metres across, uh, across and about um, uh, 14 metres deep. And that's a person for scale up there. Uh, so you can see how big this was. And the story with this one is that uh, some sheep w went down when it collapsed and they lowered a sailor on a rope because sailors obviously used to dangling on ropes. And he, he shouted to be pulled out because of the draft coming, trying to suck him in apparently. Um, but, you know, to have something like this a few years before he wrote Alice in Wonderland in Ripon um, is a connection with, with Lewis Carroll. And he had some friends down the road. Um, sorry, I'll go back. Uh, he had some friends down the road called the Maitlands, I think, or Maesters, Maesters at Littlethorpe. And they had an area about the size of this room collapse in their garden and a whole tree disappear down the hole. So he was very well aware of sinkholes and their sort of characteristics and their, their um, sort of interesting nature. And it doesn't take much to, to suggest that it actually inspired him to write Alice in Wonderland, you know, falling down a hole and going under the ground and so on. Now, Richard uh, alluded to soluble rocks, the karstic rocks of the UK. And um, this sign is actually just up the road from where I live. Um, and uh, I hate to say it actually refers to mine workings, but it's equally applicable to anywhere in Ripon. And yes, large holes can appear and can be up to about 50 feet deep. Um, so I'll just run you through the, the soluble rocks of the UK. If you, if you haven't come across them very much, um, most of you will be aware of the limestone areas with the, the caves, both in Derbyshire and the, the, the Dales and South Wales and so on. You might have come across uh, the Permian rocks at Owlcrop, um, but you probably haven't come across the fact that there's gypsum associated with them, which is also a soluble rock. So this shows the increase in solubility, basically, um, from limestone and chalk through gypsum to salt. We all know how salt dissolves. You take a handful of it, put it in a pot of water, and it's gone. Gypsum dissolves between that of salt and limestone. And all of these rocks, all these casted rocks, have uh, problems associated with them. Uh, the limestones, as I say, have cave systems in them. They have a lot of sinkholes in them. They have a lot of springs. And you can go in them and see the connections between the land collapsing and uh, the water coming out underneath. Chalk tends to dissolve at the surface. It's not a jointed rock so much as the, as the limestones. It's more porous. It tends to dissolve at the surface, but it also dissolves very well underneath superficial deposits. And it sits there quite happily with cavities at the rock superficial deposit interface until something silly happens. And in this case, it's a burst water main. So there was a burst water main up here, and that triggered off all these sinkholes surrounding it. And if you, if you look carefully, you can actually see quite a few in the gardens. Luckily, it didn't seem to affect the houses there, which is amazing considering the <laughs> number of sinkholes that are, are present. Going up the scale of solubility to gypsum, gypsum dissolves so much quicker it also forms sinkholes. Now, this, this one was just north of Ripon, and it just happened to be in a place where the farmer, when I went to see it, was the farmhouse was, whoops, I beg your pardon, the farmhouse was just over here. He took me up, up the lane and said, this is my borehole, and this is my 12-cylinder, N1,000 horsepower pump that pumps the water out, um, and I can irrigate this field just like that. And I pointed out to him that actually it's the changes in the groundwater levels that tends to trigger off the sinkholes and that he might wish to think a bit about slowing it down. Um, in America, they have 
uh, sinkhole problems, a lot in Florida and so on, associated with strawberries. Because what they do is, to, to stop the frost on the strawberries and the soft fruit, they have temperatures sensors set up on boreholes. Temperature drops too much, the, the pumps switch on, lots of water comes out the ground, the strawberries get saved and lots of sinkholes appear. Um, so you have to be a bit careful when you're dealing with this sort of area and water. And salt. Salt is really soluble. And I'm, I'll show you a bit more about this later, but this is the railway line just north of Crewe, as was. And you can see it's not a very happy railway line, since it's supposed to be flat and level and straight. Um, so there's a problem with salt as a soluble rock as well. And I'll take you through the different um, aspects of these rocks. Now, the karstic rocks are a problem. They cause subsidence. They are an engineering hazard if you're trying to build, if you're trying to do any sort of engineering. And in certain places, they put up the house premiums as well. Not usually by very much, because in general, you're more likely to be flooded than you are to be affected by something like this. Um, and uh, I'll take you a bit through gypsum formation, but this is a sinkhole at Ripon that occurred in 1980. So it was a nice grass field one minute, and the next minute it was a nine meter deep, 11 meter across hole. And it's obviously a problem to the area. Now gypsum, as alluded to in the Alice in Wonderland bit, is calcium sulfate with water. And it's an interesting rock from the point of view that it starts off as calcium sulfate in something like a sabka, uh, an evaporitic salt flat that you get around the gulf, something like that. And then over geological time as it gets buried, once it gets down to about 1,000 metres of burial, it actually dehydrates and it changes from gypsum to anhydrite. So it's still calcium sulfate, but the water has been driven out. And as it does so, it does this at a temperature of above about 42 degrees centigrade and, and about 1,000 metres of pressure. It, it dehydrates. But it sits there, you know, for several hundred million years or whatever, buried. And then when you bring it back up to the surface, it actually rehydrates and expands. So there are these changes. It's about 60% um, on burial and, and uplift. So you go from its deposition, it gets buried, it gets dehydrated, it comes back up. And basically anything less than about 1,000 metres depth, um, it's metastable. But it needs water to get to it, to actually do anything. And when it gets to within about 100 metres of the surface, the groundwater starts to affect it. It hydrates it back to, to gypsum. It um, expands. It forces out fluids and it disrupts the rock. So this isn't tectonic. This is a recumbent fold in gypsum caused by the hydration of anhydrite to gypsum. So the limestone underneath dips at about two degrees. The limestone above dips about two degrees, and the gypsum in between goes all over the place. So you've got lots of fibrous gypsum veins cut into it and, and recumbent folds. Now the other thing about this gypsum is that it dissolves. And this is a block that was about three meters square, about the size of a transit van. And it fell off the cliff at Ripon into the river. And it took about 18 months to go from that block to next to nothing. And that's how soluble it is. Now, at the time that this happened, um, one of my co-authors, Tony James, gave a, a lecture on laboratory gypsum dissolution, and Doug Holliday was at that lecture, and he said, well, if it dissolves so quickly, how come there's a big cliff of it at Ripon, next to the river? And Tony James said, well, it shouldn't be there. And I just happened to be mapping this bit at the time, so we all piled up there and looked at it, and we arrived, and there was this big block, and Tony James said, that shouldn't be there. It must have just fallen. So we went back over... A, 18 months and, as I say, saw it do this. Now, that was the cliff with the, the block of gypsum at the bottom. In 1980, I took an American geologist there in 1990, and that's the same cliff, and that's the whole of the river going underneath it. So it cut back about four or five metres in that, that period. 
So that gives you an impression of how soluble gypsum is. And that's at the surface. Now, it does actually occur in quite a, a long belt. There's two lots of it. There's this lot in the Edlington Formation, about 30 to 40 metres in, in thickness. Um, very thick under Ripon and up to Darlington. Um, and then there's another 10 metres or so up there in the Roxby Formation. And the thing about these is they both got um, limestones underneath. This is a dolomitic limestone, this is a partly dolomitic limestone. And these actually feed water through the system and help to dissolve the rock. And you, I've shown you how soluble it is, so anything that adds water to that soluble rock is going to be a problem. And at Ripon, we've got, I, I, I haven't got enough room, but if I take that right over to about there, that's the dip slope of the uh, KB formation, gathering water, and it feeds it down the dip slope towards the river, and it passes through the rock and comes up as springs in the river. And these, these springs, I say, are in, in the bottom of the river, um, but if you drill a borehole about here, you end up with about one and a half metres head of water coming out as a water spout. That's the sort of pressure that exists between the bottom down here and, and the surface. And it's that pressure and throughput of water from the, the limestone that's driving through the gypsum, dissolving it, and that's causing problems. I've, try, I've tried to illustrate the, the cavities and the collapses and so on, and I'll allude to these a bit more in a minute. Um, but that water going through dissolves the gypsum, and as a consequence, you get a lot of sulphate in the water. And the, the, this is about, from a paper about sulphate-rich springs. And all these places, Ascon in the south, there are sinkholes associated with the springs, Brotherton, Boston Spa, Knaresborough, Ripon, where they come up in the river and, and into the ground nearby, and Hogarth Ponds, um, and then Hell's Kettles, where Lewis Carroll lived as a lad. That shows the throughput of water and the dissolution of these rocks now, one of these springs, about halfway up that map, is at, uh, Ripper, at um, Knaresborough, and that's called the dropping well. Now, this water is very, very high in sulphate, but it's also got a lot of dissolved carbonate in it. And that combination of water coming out of the ground uh, makes it a petrifying spring. And it actually petrifies things that they hang underneath it. This is the top of the spring where it comes out and it's built out a sort of little uh, platform like you get in caves where, where you get um, sort of rim, rim pools and so on. And the water cascades over the edge and uh, fossil, well, fossilizes, petrifies things that they hang. So there are teddy bears and all sorts. And they have to scrape it down because they're worried about it getting too heavy and collapsing into the river. And that was a top hat that was put there in about 1900, but they keep scraping it out and around it. Um, and I've got a petrified teddy bear that my wife won't let in the house. She <laughs> says it's too creepy. <laughs> but the rocks dissolve underground. You can't get into the caves at Ripon, but if you go into the Vale of Eden, which is also Permian rocks, um, there was an open cast site there at Houtsey in the, the bee bed gypsum. And we went into this cave system, and you can see the, the walls and roof made of gypsum here, and you can see scallops in it. Uh, scallops, not the, fit, not, the, not the sea thing, but scallop shapes um, from the way the, the rock has dissolved. And if you have flowing water going over a soluble rock or a soluble item, it can be over ice. If you look at the bottom of an iceberg, it has big scallops on it. If you look in a limestone cave, it has scallops where the water flows. And if you've got scallops in the roof, it shows that that occurred with the cave full of water and the dissolution was going on all around. So this was a water-filled system that developed. And if you look in the, the roof, you can just about see a little crack. It's, it's, it's been controlled by a joint in the roof. It's dissolved along that joint. And where those joints cross, you get it going up to the surface. They'd actually scraped off the surface here, so they'd, they'd opened up. Uh, a cavity, and some of my friends were there looking in as we <coughs> popped along the bottom. Uh, the cavers are mad. They disappeared down all sorts of little rabbit holes in the, in the bottom, uh, doing their Alice in Wonderland tricks. 
Uh, but uh, I stuck to the, the ones you could actually crawl along rather than s slide along. Um, but in the back of that open car site, where this is the overburden they were stripping off, you can see a, a cavity that is developing. And this is a cave underneath in the gypsum that's collapsing and working its way up through the overlying um, shales of, of the uh, Vale of Eden. And you can see how the rock, there's actually a bit of a gypsum vein here and a bit up there, um, collapses piecemeal and the thing just works its way up. And it might just sit there doing nothing for a very long time and then someone might add a bit of water to it or something like that or, and then it will collapse. And it's that sort of mechanism that is uh, forming um, pipes that run up from cavities underground to reach the surface. If you go to the uh, Durham coast, there used to be a lot of very thick anhydrite on the Durham coast, and that has dissolved away. And when it dissolved away, it developed breccia pipes with the overlying rock collapsing down. And here you can see one of these breccias, um, which I think is a bit of this one in here. This occurred quite a long time ago. It's, it's been truncated by the glacial deposits. So, you know, this is, this is a pre-glacial thing. It could, it could have been tertiary or whatever, but all that gypsum on the coast has dissolved and you've got these big breccia pipes. And coming further south to Sherbin and Elmit, which is just east of Leeds, this is the, the Brotherton Formation, the, the upper of the two limestones, and this is a breccia pipe that's come up through it. Now, it looks as if it closes, but if you can imagine a cylindrical shape cut obliquely, because the quarry face isn't vertical, then you end up with this, this sort of effect. So it's actually a vertical pipe sliced through slightly obliquely. Now, the original geologist that mapped it didn't appreciate that and thought they'd been injected from below because they saw them closing out at the top. But they are, in fact, this is actually the overlying Roxby formation that has dropped down into the cavity and gives these breccia pipes going through the, s the sequence. You also get a bit of um, folding and foundering of the strata as well. And in some places, that can be extreme. It can stand on end. It can do all sorts of nasty things. And this is a stylized um, image of, of what I think is going on. You've got the, the thick gypsum underneath. You've got it dissolving. You've got the material collapsing. And in some places, plugs go down. In other places, you're left with cavities. And you end up with cave deposits as well. So I've seen boreholes drilled, which have gone through glacial deposits, through limestone, through mudstone, into gypsum, and then have gone into peat and laminated clay because that's been washed down into the cave system. And initially, this rather perplexed me because you don't expect to find peat at 40 metres depth. And you think, the driller's got it wrong. He's, he's messed up the cores. But no, it's true. It does happen. And you get these, these breccia pipes, which are horrendous to drill. The drillers always have problems. Now, oh, I'll go back. When, when these collapse, they break up at the surface, and you end up with a sinkhole. And this was basically the first sinkhole I came across at Ripon uh, when I was mapping there. And this, this was 1979. I was mapping it in 1980. And this lady is standing next to where her garage was. And you can see the sort of circular concentric cracks around it and a nice sinkhole. That's probably about a metre and a half deep. And then it just missed the back of the house. Um, I went back a few years later, and that's the same sinkhole from a different angle, I'm afraid. But if you notice the height of the telegraph pole and this very big car, you can, you can see how much it's gone down. Um, that telegraph pole is there. And it was three or four meters higher than it is there. And that is still going down. So once, once they've started, they, they do tend to keep going because there's material being dissolved underground. There's also some stuff that's collapsed in, being washed away underground. And it sort of perpetuates the sinkhole. Um, a few years later, just up the road and around the corner, this one appeared. 
uh, near the clock tower in Ripon if you ever drive up that way um, and go to Lightwater Valley or, or head north from Ripon. Um, this was just a few metres across and a, a few metres deep, but it was next to a terrace of houses that they demolished that was called Broken Back Houses. Um, unfortunately, they built a new terrace of houses there, and I'm not that convinced that they'll be there for very long because the one over the road, is, which is also new, is, is subsiding. Coming a bit closer to, to recent, this one occurred in February 2014. This is about 50 metres from that black and white picture that I showed you. And the actual sinkhole ran sort of out this way and through the house, but it sort of demolished the back of the house, and the, the whole house has been taken down now. Um, it was at a time when they were trying to get planning permission to build on these, this area, and there were a few questions being asked by locals about the stability. I believe it's going to be a caravan site now, so that nothing, nothing heavy is put on it and it can be moved if anything is going to happen. And then just before uh, Christmas last year, this happened also on Magdalen's Road in Ripon. These have all been on Magdalen's Road. These are all, this is about 150 metres further down the road. And the building site that they want to build on is just over here. That's the other end of it. Um, and this one was about five metres deep um, and about 12 metres across, concentric cracks around the outside. And some colleagues of mine from BGS took um, a drone up and actually built a, photographed it and built a 3D model of it. And because it had happened and, and everyone had been evacuated, the fire brigade were actually really very good in that they wanted to know what the cracks were doing, so they painted them. So the first day, they painted them yellow, and the second day, they painted them blue. And this is, this is the big hole in the garden where everything collapsed. And then these are concentric cracks running round. This is a new building, which... They're, they're inquiring as to what the foundations actually are, as to whether or not it's likely to be safe or not. Um, but there was also a burst water pipe, a burst drain across here. Now, it's an interesting thing. Did the sinkhole break the drain, or did the drain cause the sinkhole, or was it a sort of vicious circle? Because people said, oh, this drain kept getting blocked. And the, the authorities are saying, well, well, the, well, the or the insurers are saying, well, it's the uh, drainage company's responsibility because they didn't maintain the drain, and the, and the drainage company is saying, well, actually, no, the sinkhole broke the drain. It's not our responsibility. So you've got this toing and froing of loss adjusters, and, and it's not my fault. Um, but it's one of the things. You don't want to add water to a sinkhole, wherever it is, whether it's a, a drain a drainage system, burst drain, burst water main. It's all bad news if there's sinkholes, susceptibility in the area. Just across the road, um, also a road that runs right angles to Magdalen's Road, there's this sort of problem with the houses. They're, they're all sagged. They've been like this for, for years. Um, but there's also artesian water and sulphate-rich springs in that field uh, behind. And this area was, was known as Bog Field before they built the houses. Um, so it sort of says something for it. This, this is the um, sinkhole I first showed um, next to Canon Bagcocks, taken from a, a different view out of the house window. And one of the things I've done over the years is initially we were using the coal board scheme, but I extended it a bit because they didn't quite go far enough and put together a a scheme that sort of meshes in with what a lot of damage recording has been done. And you can go and walk around a town and basically map out the damage to the buildings. Now, a sinkhole like that is pretty obvious, but if it's just 10 or 20 centimetres of movement in a field, it's not very obvious. But if you've got a house, it, that's really severe. I mean, it's, it's a big problem. So you can actually go around, look at the damage and the leaning houses and you know, what the window sills are doing and so on. And there's a sort of, with each of these numbers, there's a, um, a set of categories that you can map. And I had a student in 1987, another one in 2000, um, and I've, I've sort of carried on um, recording like this. And this is a, a map 
showing Magdalen's Road through here. Um, that was a sinkhole in 1980-81, that was 2014, that was 2016, that's the clock tower in 1997. There wasn't a building there, but that was Broken Back Terrace. Um, and you can actually map out the damage to buildings and use that combined with the topographical and morphological mapping to map out the subsidence prone areas. And that's, that's what we've done at Ripon uh, to actually look at how the subsidence is developing. So it, it's quite a useful tool. And this, this shows basically a section right through Ripon. And uh, the, the main town is here with Magdalen's Road in this sort of situation. Um, once you get across the river into this area, you're, you're talking about the Sherwood sandstone up here and big deep sinkholes. And over here, you've got maybe 30, 40 metres of gypsum here, plus another 10 there. You've got 50 metres of gypsum, potentially, that can dissolve. When, when rocks collapse, they actually bulk up a bit. But in order to fill up a hole made by 50 metres of gypsum dissolving, you actually need an overburden of about 200 metres or more. And consequently, everything that dissolves to a large extent bursts out at the surface and gives you a sinkhole. So it's a very susceptible area. And as I say, if, you've, if you're sat with something like that and you get a bit of water going into it, that will trigger it off. And even if you're sat on something like this and water goes into it, it can also reactivate it. So this is a map showing sinkholes at Ripon with the dates of where they went down. Um, and oh, where is it? That's I've lost it. That's the one in front of the, the house, 1997 onwards. Uh, that's Magdalen's Road, that one, that one, the clock tower. Um, and the one over the river in here that I showed in the field. You can see there are a lot more that have, have happened. And if you start looking at this, you can see there's a bit of a pattern to them as well. They, they do seem to form lines. And... A good example is this lot. That's a nice line. You know, a lot of active dissolution going on, a lot of subsidence over a long period of time. And one of the things I did was just take a, a ruler. I've tried doing it on a computer as well. But uh, initially, I just took a ruler and I joined up the, line, the dots. And if you join up the sinkholes in lines, you end up with this rose diagram. If you look at the long axes, you end up with that. And if you look at the joints, you end up with that. And Although they don't quite always coincide precisely, the, the north, south, and the east, west are there. Um, and what I surmise is that, or surmised at the time, that was that there was a joint controlled cave system under the town, and that what I was looking at was either the east, west, north, south, or the diagonals. And it could be that the water's going like that along a cave system. I was then lucky enough to go to the Ukraine and with Alexander Klimchuk we went and uh, he's published a, a tremendous amount on gypsum dissolution. We went down some of the gypsum caves in the Ukraine and this is from a paper he published. This is an open cast site so they had good access to the caves from the open cast site. These red dots are where the roof of the cave is collapsing in. These yellowy-orange ones are the sinkholes at the surface. And you can see how the cave system relates very precisely to the joint system. And furthermore, this is a thick gypsum bed sitting on top of a limestone, with artesian pressure having driven water through it to generate this. It's all been dewatered now to open cast it. But it's, it's very similar to Ripon. So I surmise that what we have at Ripon is a joint controlled cave system in very thick gypsum um, and that's called, with, with artesian water driven through it and that's causing the problems. In one of these caves you can see how actually a small hole in the roof can actually let in a large amount of material. So it doesn't always have to be a big funnel that's going down, it can actually wash material down through quite small holes. And if you, can, oh, beg your pardon. if you can imagine water rushing through here, it would actually carry the fine material away. So you've got this sort of 
um, erosion at the base plus dissolution at the base that drives the, um, the formation of these cavities. Well, in about 1998, uh, eight, seven, seven, eight, um, Harrogate Council and Department of Environment commissioned a study, which I didn't do, um, but uh, Alan Thompson of um, Simon's Travers Morgan did, and they, they came up with a zonation for Ripon. And in this yellow zone, there are actually quite strong planning constraints which involved investigation and, uh, and mitigation and all sorts. Unfortunately, it didn't actually get invoked quite as strongly as it should have been, and there's now discussions going on as to how to improve it, because people were ticking all the boxes and saying they'd done everything, and, and saying there wasn't a problem when there was, was a problem, and they hadn't actually mitigated. So there are now new buildings, some, some in here, which are suffering subsidence, and they shouldn't have done if this had been adhered to properly. Um, so would you build in Ripon, is the question. Uh, now, Broken Back Terrace was over there, and the house over the road is subsiding, and the, the site where they put the caravans where they wanted to build is just over the back as well. Um, if you do a lot of investigation, geophysics, boreholes, not deep boreholes, because you can intersect the water and make the problem worse, but boreholes to look at what the base of the superficials is doing on top of the uh, underlying rock. Um, and if you put mitigation in, you, you can actually develop. And one site just down the road, we did microgravity geophysics over, we did boreholes and, and probing, and there's a sinkhole about here. And this is a thick rafted foundation um, that uh, supports this building. And if the engineers have done it all right, it shouldn't be affected by subsidence. And if there is some subsidence, it should be strong enough to span. Now, unfortunately, the, the local council, um, we were saying it should span about 14 metres. They seem to be happy to accept three and a half, um, which is the size of a patio door. Um, and that wasn't what was intended. So, the, you know, they've been getting away with it, and now, they're, now it's coming home to roost a bit. But this, this one was actually designed to span quite considerable amounts. There's a new bypass to Ripon. Well, it's not that new now. Um, but what they've done in that is put layers of geogrid material in the embankment. So if there's a collapse, rather than get the, the bus go into the, the hole, um, you end up with a, a sag in the ground and can hopefully remediate it. Similarly, the bridge at Ripon. I had a great argument with, with the engineers for the bridge, and, but after about a year, they, they changed the design. And they went from a conventional thing like that, and you've seen it in earthquake areas in America, you know, where one bit goes and the whole lot collapses, to having a, a strengthened bridge, which is actually designed to lose any one bit, any one support without collapsing. And this, this is the bridge at Ripon. Any one of these can go, and it will still stand, and under the piers they've got pressure sensors linked up to a warning system so that they know if it's going to go. There is actually a sinkhole under that pillar there. <laughs> and I'd have preferred it moved slightly, but they didn't want to move it, so they piled into it with 50-metre piles. Um, so, uh, but they've, they've done something about it. I mentioned water, and I don't know if any of you have come across suds sustainable drainage systems. It's, it's something that it tends to be put in for new developments now. You have to try and be ecological with your drainage, etc. And one way of getting rid of the water is to actually put it into the ground. Now, as soon as you get onto any karstic rocks, that's bad news. So, you know, we, we strongly encourage people not to put in subsurface drainage systems um, into these sorts of rocks. Ground source heat pumps are also highly problematic in this sort of stuff. And um, I, I did actually allude to the expansion of gypsum when it gets wet. In Stauffen in Germany, they uh, restored the town hall, spent millions on it, and then decided to put in a ground source heat pump system into the anhydrite underneath it. Unfortunately, that hydrated the anhydrite and 
the town hall in Stauffen is now uplifting and has severe damage to it caused by the hydration of anhydrite to gypsum and the ground source heat pump. So it's a, a problematic area, this. You, you don't want ground source heat pumps, open loops anyway, in, in this, and you don't want suds in gypsum, limestone, salt, or anything like that. Now, I mentioned witches in my title, and um, I'm going to talk now a bit about salt dissolution and the problems of, of witches. Now, they're not the witches that fly on broomsticks. They're the witches, because witch is the name of a medieval salt spring. But this picture from Culvert, he did a book called Salt in Cheshire, which you can actually find on the internet and download the whole book, because it's about 1,200 pages and about this thick. Um, but it's a fantastic book, fantastic pictures. And this is one of a house that's obviously being... Um, sorted out. There's another one in there of a shop that they've jacked up. It's, it's entitled Shoplifting. Uh, but uh, I've shown you the karstic rocks and I've mentioned the, the dissolution rate going up. Salt is really soluble. Uh, it's bad news if it's near the surface. And under parts of Cheshire and Staffordshire and Worcestershire and so on, there are salt deposits that come near to surface. They don't actually reach the surface because they've dissolved underground. And you end up with this collapsed area of interbedded material. If you've got any mudstone and such like interbedded with it, that ends up in this when the salt dissolves. And if you've got any overlying rock, that ends up in it. And you end up with a breccia, collapsed breccia, over the top. And the old drillers, when they drilled a borehole, if they hit wet. If they hit brine at the salt interface, they called it wet rock head. And if they went into dry stuff, they called it dry rock head. It's not rock head like geologists know it. it. It's actually the term for the top of the salt, whether it's wet or dry. And on here I show a few of the th features that you get in the Cheshire salt field. You've got salt springs, which are locally called witches. Um, they're also Roman, Roman springs. There are a couple of the places in, in uh, Cheshire were called Selina or Selene, um, and those later became medieval witches. So you've got places like Nantwich, Northwich, Droitwich, all those sort of witch names. Um, they, old um, entrepreneurs in Victorian times, you know, with children working down the mine and all the rest of it, they, they looked for the brine. They looked for a place where they could drill a borehole or sink a well and take the brine out. And this is called wild brining. They just intersected the brine run. They also mined it, but then they got greedy. And when the mines flooded, they then decided to pump the brine out of the mines and cause all sorts of chaos that way. And then modern salt mining is down in the dry bits. Um, and modern brine extraction is in the dry bit, but making what they call controlled brine caverns. These are at depths of three, four hundred metres sort of things under Cheshire. And if they've got it right, these are, all, these are stable. But some of them are about the size of St Paul's Cathedral. You know, they're big holes. And big holes don't tend to live in geology for a very long time, especially in salt. So how many years, how many hundreds, thousands of years these last, um, I don't know. Um, but people pumped out the salt and this is a picture of a street in Droitwich, and you can see, a bit like Ripon, a nice subsidence here. Um, this is one of the, the brine pumps, preserved brine pump. And that's the same house I showed, sloping. And this is Gurney's Lane pumping station. This is part of the infrastructure that was there, and there would have been a beam engine in here and uh, a boiler and so on pumping the brine out. And right next to it, you can see there's subsidence affecting the houses. Well, this is sort of Victorian-type subsidence, but in the 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s, sort of large industrial salt extraction started to occur up the road from here about five miles. They intersected the same brine, but they drew it in from a lot greater areas. And the same in Cheshire. Um, they were drawing wild brine in. And this is a a controlled brine pump. They actually put toxic waste down some of these. Um, so it's, it's, it's an interesting uh, geological scenario for the future. Um, 
How it's going to play out will be anybody's guess. Um, but I mentioned the um, salt areas. There's Northwich, Middlewich, Nantwich, all these witch names. There's also other little places like Shirley Witch. And when you get down to Droitwich, you've got Dirtwich and Upwich within Droitwich. Uh, <laughs> lots of witches. Um, at BGS, we use the geological map to actually uh, work out areas susceptible to subsidence. So these darker areas are where the salt is at wet rock head. And these are more prone to subsidence than the surrounding areas where it's at dry rock head or buried beneath overlying deposits. Um, when they've extracted the salt in Cheshire, they, they've frequently formed flashes. And it's a good name because it sort of happens pretty quickly. And a lot of these are filled up with water. So this, this is a pretty typical Cheshire flash um, caused by salt dissolution, man-made, driven by man. And if you, if you look at ordnance survey maps, you know, I, mean, I do this for Ripon as well, you can, you can see the progression of sinkholes around an area. And this is, this is 1980, 1882. This is northeast of Crewe on the, the main railway line. And you can see these two arrows. They're not actually pointing at anything much. But within a short time, that's now starting to show a bog here by 1899, and a slightly bigger bog. And if you look at this, this was now showing a pond by 1910. 1938 is probably, a, probably the same map, actually. They might not have done very much, but you can, you can still see there's a, a good <coughs> pond there. The geologist who mapped it in 1957 mapped out these green areas as being flashes, and the Ordnance Survey map of 2005 shows these as ponds. And that's a set of digitization from the BGS maps and uh, showing what we call the, the sinkholes and the, and the salt cast areas. And you can see there are quite a number of uh, linear features running out from these. This is the railway line, and that's, that's a pond. So that is where the salt has dissolved under the railway line. Now, you'll notice this is unusual for railway lines. All the gantries are on big concrete blocks, and they've also got lots of bolts and things. And this is all designed to be able to be jacked up and lowered as things happen um, so that they could keep the wires I had a, a very slow speed limit on this. Um, not what you want on a railway line. But when you actually take one step back, you can see here's the railway line, uh, and you can see these linear features. And these were salt works. And you can see how the linear features run to the salt works as they extracted the brine, drew in the fresh water onto the top of the salt, and caused problems. And you can see that's that's 10 kilometers. So they're, they're drawing in water to these old salt works, or were drawing it in, or brine, from 10 kilometers or more away, causing lots and lots of subsidence. And because of this, they, they introduced the Brine Subsidence Compensation Board to actually put a levy on, on salt extraction to pay for the damage that they were doing. Um, this wild brining has ceased, but it's now going back to the natural sit situation. And it's a natural situation that's been enhanced by what the, the wild briners have done. So it's different to what was there originally. And it has these channels, basically, still allowing the water to, to flow through the area as brine. I alluded to zoning the country. We've zoned the country using geological data and various algorithms uh, for sort of slopes, for the solubility of the rocks, and so on. And that's the salt field in there. This is the gypsum up here at Ripon, um, and the chalk, and so on. And this is a, a BGS data set called GeoSure, um, which is, is used to help with planning and uh, development. But I, I, I've shown you a lot about the UK. Um, 
we're, we're not alone. And this is just gypsum. You've also got to bear in mind there's, there's limestone, there's, there's chalk, and there's salt elsewhere in Europe. But these are just places where gypsum subsidence, similar to Ripon, has occurred. And plaster of Paris is made from gypsum. Under Paris, there are lots of gypsum mines. Um, there are also areas with gypsum caves and natural subsidence and problems. And they, they have a uh, set of regulations for building because of gypsum subsidence under, under Paris. Um, in Spain, near Zaragoza, um, this sort of thing is happening in the old town of Calatayud. Uh, structure, old, old buildings are affected like this. And I surveyed, or, or my, I worked, sorry, with my Spanish colleague who used them, the system uh, we developed for Ripon to survey the building damage here in Calatayud. And in Lithuania, lots of, lots of sinkholes um, in northern Lithuania and um, south of Latvia. So we're not alone in having these problems. And they're not all bad, <laughs> because... Sinkholes make wonderful golf courses, and this is Ripon Golf Course. And the people that know Ripon Golf Course and play it say, well, this is a wonderful sinkhole, this, because this is just over the brow of the hill. <laughs> and you can see the flag for the next green, more or less, and you aim for it, not knowing that if you fall short, you end up in this. Um, so then they, they do actually have uh, a leisure aspect to them as well and um, on that I will finish thank you thank you very much Tony questions in the front row here you, you made reference to oh, can we just can we just come down so, with a microphone so everybody can hear you Hello there. You, you made reference to Broken Back Terrace. Yes. Did it get that name as a result of a sinkhole in an earlier period? No, it was just the, the fact that it was about six houses and it, it was like a <coughs> banana. And unfortunately, I've only, I didn't have a picture with me, but I, I, um, there's one in a publication that I could have put up. But it's, it's because the, both the sinkhole was developing and also because of peat that tends to develop in the sinkholes. But the, this Victorian terrace uh, did have about a metre dip in the middle of it. So the and name did come from a sinkhole then? Oh, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, because it was so damaged. I wouldn't buy the new house there. Uh, <laughs> uh, the lady with the red jumper. Uh, Dr Cooper, I'm very often asked, and um, we've met before because I lived in uh, 94, Magdalene's Road. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and I was the one that almost went into the pit that night, the morning after. Uh, people very often ask me the material that they, they put on the top of the, the hole uh, that, that they dug right down to. Uh, what is that material? And do you think it will uh, stop, stop the, the jittering, the, the movement of the earth? Um. I honestly don't know what material they put in. I mean, there are two approaches that, to, to these holes. One is to put in a, a fine material, which is what we did at um, the one at Eurobank Bank Terrace. That had a history of it funneling in, and basically it keeps going down. It's got two gar four garages, uh, several trailer loads of stuff, about a dozen lorry loads of, of, of crushed rock in it, and it just keeps going down. And they surcharge it to about a metre above the surface. And about two years later, it's a conical depression back in. Uh, we advised against putting anything solid in that because we thought it would just choke the top, let the stuff fall down underneath, and the sides would ravel in and make a much bigger problem than, than they had already. So it's being controlled. It's being supported by the fine material that's in it pressing out on the side so it's not getting bigger, but it just keeps funneling in. Now, I think they might use concrete on the other one. I think, actually, I was told that, that they used a concrete... Um, on my neighbour at 92, who's, there was the sinkhole, 
uh, but I think they did use a concrete uh, mixture. Yes. Um, and uh, but everyone asked me, you know, is this going to stop the the movement? Because they've done the exact opposite that they did at your bank. Yes. They've well, your bank had a long history of funneling in. Um, the one near you um, hasn't got that history and had a trigger of a broken pipe sitting above it. And the consultant that has dealt with it um, felt that, as far as I understand, putting concrete in, and, and I believe there's a, a standpipe or a borehole in it to, to monitor what's going on underneath. Yes, um, I think that, that, is, th that is the case. Yes. So um, is from my, my neighbour tells me that that is the case. Uh, but um, And there's still the ongoing battle because definitely over the years we we all knew that the Yorkshire water were constantly coming and mending broken pipes in that alleyway, the water. Yes. Well, as I say, it's a chicken and egg thing that... Uh, <laughs> The collapse can break the pipes, and if it carries on, um, the water leaking from the pipes can ag aggravate the collapse. Now, I mean, one approach is to fill it with concrete, spread it out so that it's got a plug there, but also leave an opening so that you can see what's going on underneath. And if what's going on underneath is proved to be a cavity developing, there is also always the scope then of grouting it up by putting a concrete or cement grout down the hole to fill in what's underneath. Um, it does need monitoring. And another way of monitoring it, which um, could be done, is to actually measure the microgravity across the slab and around the hole. And if that microgravity starts to change, you will know you've got less rock underneath you um, and therefore will know that something is happening. Um, if, it goes, if it goes down because there's less rock, um, you know you've got a cavity. I think you, could, you two could talk for a long time, actually. <laughs> can we, can we, uh, there's a, a gentleman here had a question for a little while. Thank you. You showed us a graphic of the sinkholes in Ripon with dates attached to their discovery. There seem to be very few in the 19th century and very many in the last half of the 20th century. Is there a direct correlation with population or water extraction or something? No, no, that's um, actu actually a factor of surveys. And um, the area was surveyed in the, in the 1900s by geological survey surveyors, and they recorded quite a lot of sinkholes. And also there were geologists like Reverend Toot, recording the sinkholes. And people were really interested in stuff like that. And then you had a period where nobody really looked at it. And I've been through lots and lots of things like the Ripon Millenary Record, the newspapers and so on, trying to pull out uh, information for that period. Then I surveyed it in 1980, so there's a lot of information from that period and the reminiscence of the farmers and so on, saying, oh, one went down over there in, you know, whatever. Um, so you've, you've got these, this bias towards when it was surveyed. And since then, I've kept my eye on it, and people have told me when they've happened. So we've, we've got quite a good record from about 1980 onwards. It goes back with the reminiscences of the farmers, etc. then quite a gap, and then a spike round about the, the late 1800s. Yes, yes, it does bias the, the, the data set. So when people say, I'd like to do some uh, sort of uh, fancy statistics, no, I can't say it, statistics on your data, I have to say, no, I don't want you to because of that bias. It's not, it's not good enough. I noticed that you're drinking Harrogate water. Uh, is there a link? Uh, I haven't drunk any of it, actually. But, um, <laughs> Har Harrogate water... Is actually, is actually bottled at source, and if you look up the source, it actually comes from the Carboniferous, um, from, from the sandstones to the west of Harrogate. It's not. There's no link, no.
um, they, they seem to sort of go on giving <laughs> going downwards, but no longer expansion. Even the ones that are on in lines, what stops the ones that are in lines coalescing? Well, they, they do tend to coalesce um, when they hit the superficial deposits. So what happens is that, that if you've got a fairly solid rock, it's just spanning. And it's an interesting thing about sinkholes is that they tend to be round. Even in really jointed rock, they tend to be round. And I, I liken it to a, to a tunnel. You know, it's that, a tunnel has its most strength in a, a circular shape because of the way the, the stresses go round it. And similarly, in a, in a vertical sh shape, the stresses go round it. So you tend to end up with a circular hole, and it's by gravity that th the things are collapsing. So it tends to work in a vertical manner rather than a, a, a lateral manner. However, if you have a pipe that comes up to, say, sand and gravel, um, or especially wet sand, uh, that doesn't have a, the strength to stand up, so it funnels in. So a lot of them are conical when they're, they're in superficial deposits, but vertical-sided when they're in rock. So it depends on the strength of the materials. They, but in the superficial deposits, they do tend to amalgamate. And some of the very big subsidence areas around Ripon are actually made up of amalgamated subsidence hollows because there's thick superficial deposits. And then those have been filled in with peat. So you get the developer saying, oh, that's a nice flat field. Um, and then puts down a few boreholes and says, well, that one went five metres and that one went 25 through the peat and they're all over the place. And um, I told, told a guy about 40 years ago to contour the boreholes he drilled and he ended up with a whole load of conical depressions under the peat, uh, all amalgamated. So we have the last question for over there. I know Tony's hanging around for quite a while after this if people want to tackle him. I found that especially interesting because I was brought up in a road just outside Watford where sinkholes kept appearing over the 20 years or so that I lived there. But my question is actually whether any of the historic buildings in Ripon, including the cathedral, have been affected and whether there is any policy of uh, sort of preventative policy of dealing with this kind of situation in the future should should there be occurrences under valuable buildings like that? Well, um, as far as I know, there's no problem with the cathedral itself. Um, it's actually on a spur between two valleys. It's got the Skell and the, the Ewer. <coughs> so it sits there in a place where you might actually expect the groundwater to divide. So I'm, I'm hoping there's divine division of the groundwater <laughs> uh, and that it is safe. Um, but it is on gypsum. It, it has in the past had a tower that fell down, but I believe that was just bad building. And lots of towers fell down in, when they've been building them. Um, the old almshouses on Magdalen's Road which are quite an interesting set of ancient buildings, um, are suffering subsidence. Um, and uh, Magdalene's Chapel, which is very old, is actually leaning over slightly and is buttressed. So um, that might have a bit of subsidence under it. But basically, you don't want to interfere with what's happening down there, because if you actually try and grout up such a cave system. You could have a very big cave system. One, it would be almost impossible to grout. Two, if you do grout it up, uh, the dissolution then moves to the adjacent ground. If you grout it up, you change the groundwater levels. You know, it's a balance that I wouldn't like to, to upset. I'd rather leave it to, um, to nature. Tony, thanks very much. It's a couple of reflections from me. Um, you know, people <coughs> often think we have really boring geology in this country, and I guess to some extent that is, is the case. We don't have huge earthquakes, and we certainly don't have uh, any well, vo uh, active volcanism today. But I know myself that some of these things can literally happen overnight, and uh, you know, the, these catastrophic collapses <coughs> and major impacts on people's lives, as, as we've just learned this afternoon. And my final reflection, it's just great to see that our science has had um, a significant contribution to English <coughs> literature over the years. I know that Thomas Hardy, uh, you know, great novelist and poet, 
was also a, a, a keen geologist, and you'll see, if you read any of his work, you, you will pick out some you know, quite shrewd geological um, observations in there. But Tony, I know you spent many, many years uh, over your career studying this area. Nobody knows the Ripon area in particular as well as you do. Uh, and thank you very much for coming here this afternoon and sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you. Yeah, really, great. It's just that uh, sometimes the questions can go on for